Greetings YouTube, we are back today. Let's talk about Christians. They love to talk about how loving, dutiful and compassionate they are. Yet I have yet to meet one who does not practice hypocrisy to the highest degree. Their willful ignorance of the Bible combined with their two-faced idealism to preach it, has made us sick, hasn't it? For nearly 2,000 years Biblicists have been lecturing people on the importance of adhering to the Bible's teachings on ethics, manners, and morality. They quote Jesus and Paul profusely, with a liberal sprinkling of Old Testament moralism. The problem with their approach lies not only in an oft-noted failure to practice what they preach, but an equally pronounced tendency to ignore what the Bible itself preaches. Christians practice what can only be described as selective morality. What they like, they cling to and shove down others' throats. What they don't like, they ignore vehemently. That which is palatable and acceptable is supposedly applicable to all, while that which is obnoxious, inconvenient, or self-denying is only applicable to those addressed 2,000 years ago. Their hypocrisy is so rampant that even the validity of calling oneself Christian is in question. I see so many people enjoy quoting the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, and some of Paul's sermons, but don't even pretend to heed other, equally valid, maxims. I've mentioned pro-life and conservatism in other sermons. This one is going to sum up the rest of my beefs. Hypocrisy of marital relationships. So many Christians try to rationalize this but it is clear that a true follower of Jesus can neither divorce someone nor marry someone who is divorced. There is an exception to the rule, however. If spouse commits adultery, divorce is permissible. On the same token, the Bible also says that anyone who obtains a divorce and marries another is an adulterer. Remember that 80 of this country is Christian yet we have a 50 divorce rate. A majority of divorces are a result of irreconcilable differences, not adultery, which implies that Christians are again practicing selective morality. How many Christians are working on a second, third or fourth marriage? One. So they are no longer to but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19, 6 and Mark 10, 9. Two. Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Matthew 5, 32, 19, 9 and Luke 16, 18. Three. Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. Matthew 5, 32. 4. Whosoever shall put away his wife, and marry another, committeth adultery against her. Mark 10, 11 and Luke 16, 18, which applies to women as well. Mark 10, 12. On to another beef. The Christian attempts to put prayer into schools run directly counter to biblical teachings. Jesus said prayer should be a private affair devoid of public display. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room or closet, and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Matthew 6, 5-6 RSV Biblicists violate this on a regular basis and have no intention of correcting their behavior. They demand that evolution be taken out of the curriculum. They demand parochial school receive voucher programs so that they may collect public funding. Christians continuously pray in public, that is, churches, street corners, schools, courts, etc. Yet all the while they never stop to think this is in direct violation to the God they pray to. I, of course, know why this is voluntarily ignored. Public prayer forces the pairs of school children to jump on the bandwagon and pray. We are all aware that the church is simply a business which employs tactics similar to that of tobacco industries in recruiting consumers. Get the kids while they are young and vulnerable so that they become donating members of the church when they reach adulthood. I find it humorous that other businesses warn their consumers on the package that it is dangerous to one's health while churches don't put warning labels on the Bible for the pornography and immorality it contains. The psychological damage organized religion causes is notably prevalent. Cancer from smoking and cirrhosis from drinking is just as harmful as the psychosis believers develop concerning reality. 
the I see demons complex is more rampant in Christians than it is in asset dropping space cadets. I am not saying this as a joke. There are literal studies done on this topic and they are in accordance to what I am conveying here. Christians always use the excuse that the above mentioned verse is somehow metaphorical, yet they take Paul's maxim that men should pray with their heads uncovered very seriously. I assume this is generally followed because removing one's hat isn't particularly inconvenient. Any man who prays or prophecies with his head covered dishonors his head. 1 Corinthians 11, 4 RSV. On the other hand, Paul's tenet that women must keep their heads covered with a veil during prayer is quite inconvenient and, for this reason, has either been rationalized away or ignored, although it is no less binding than any other moral law in the New Testament. But any woman who prays or prophecies with her head unveiled dishonors her head, for if a woman will not veil herself, then we should cut off her hair, but if it be disgraceful for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her wear a veil, judge for yourself, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with head uncovered? 1 Corinthians 11, 5-13 RSV, the selectivity in which these verses are followed screams hypocrisy.